in everyday life, if you're looking over your shoulder every second, every time I hear a siren, I think they're coming for me. On the night of Tuesday, June 20th, 2012, Ashley Biggs set out to make her final delivery pizza for the night at around 11.45 p.m. Little did anyone know, it was going to be Ashley's last ever delivery. Her car and body was found the next day in a neighboring county. It didn't take investigators long to find her killer, but as the years went by, suspicion started to grow and investigators began to believe Ashley's killer had not acted alone. A jailhouse confession and long withheld secret recording would eventually bring a second suspect to justice for Ashley and her family. Who had Ashley made an enemy of? What pushed her killers to take her life so violently? Hello and welcome back to M7 Crime Storytime, where we cover solved, unsolved and twisted cases from around the world. Today we dive into the twisted and disturbing case of Ashley Biggs. With a population of just under 14,000, New Franklin is a fairly small city in southwestern Summit County, Ohio. It's home to the Portage Lake State Park and the historic Tudor House on the Portage Lake waterfront, famous for its breathtaking vistas. It offers residents a rural and wholesome experience with a fairly affordable cost of living. Its residents are known for being some of the friendliest people one could meet, and they're what gives the town its unique charm. New Franklin ranks 61% safer than other cities in America and often makes the 100 safest cities in the nation annually. And it's for that reason that the death of Ashley Biggs created such a stir. Ashley Nicole Biggs was born on January 9, 1987 in New Franklin, Ohio. She was an only child and was raised by her mother, Kimberly Ann Biggs, and stepfather, Ted Grebenstein. Growing up, Ashley was described as being kind and gentle. She always had a ready smile and was full of laughter. She grew up surrounded by a family that loved her unconditionally. When she was 17 years old, she met 25-year-old Chad Cobb through mutual friends during a double date at a local skating rink. The two had an instant chemistry and began a serious relationship. Ashley and Chad eventually moved in together and a year later welcomed a baby girl named Gracie into their lives. But their relationship started to become strained. Friends would say that Chad was abusive towards Ashley, and he often hit her. Soon after her relationship with Chad ended, Ashley signed up with the U.S. Army in 2008 and gave Chad full custody of their daughter. After serving briefly in the military, she was given a medical discharge due to her severe asthma. When she returned home, she started working as a pizza delivery driver for Domino's Pizza in Akron, Ohio. Ashley had also begun a relationship with another woman named Brittany Dunstan. With a new job and relationship, Ashley decided she wanted to raise her daughter Gracie with her new partner. After a long drawn out court battle, Ashley was awarded full custody of Gracie, much to Chad's dismay. This led to Ashley taking out a protective order against Chad after he began threatening the safety of herself and her partner Brittany. It was around 11.42 p.m. on Tuesday night, June 20th, 2012, when a late pizza order came into the Domino's in Akron, Ohio. The woman on the line identified herself as Jen and ordered a half pepperoni, half mushroom pizza. Ashley was on duty as a driver that night and opted to make the delivery. The delivery address would take her to a business area in New Franklin, Ohio. She was given instructions to go around to the back of the building to drop off the order. Ashley left shortly before 12 a.m. The staff expected her to be back within minutes for closing time as the address was nearby and the roads would have been quiet. But over an hour passed, and there was still no sign of Ashley. Her manager then called Brittany, who had not heard from her either. Concerned, the manager then placed a call to the New Franklin Police Department to report Ashley as a missing person. Officers arrived at the Domino's at 1.21 a.m. and spoke to the manager. He explained that Ashley went out to make the delivery over an hour earlier and hadn't returned. Just as police were taking statements from the staff, Brittany arrived at the Domino's to find out what had happened to Ashley. Brittany told officers that she was concerned about Ashley because she was having problems with her ex-boyfriend, Chad Cobb. Police assured them that they'd search for Ashley and drove to Turkeyfoot Lake Road, the address given for the pizza order. When they arrived at the address, situated along a lonely dark road, 
they noted that it was a business that was obviously closed. They searched around the parking lot but found no sign of Ashley's gray Ford Taurus. What they did find was a large pool of blood and change scattered around the area. Their investigation was now more than just a simple missing persons case. Officers were sure that someone had lured Ashley out to the empty parking lot. They also figured that it might have been someone who knew her and was aware that she was working the late shift that night. Investigators began by interviewing Brittany, Ashley's partner. She told police about Chad and Ashley's bitter custody battle for their daughter, Gracie. Brittany also explained that Ashley had recently taken out a protection order against Chad after he'd made threats against the two of them. Brittany told officers that Chad was not too happy about their relationship and didn't approve of Ashley's bisexual lifestyle. She described Chad as being possessive and jealous and stated that he felt personally offended that Ashley had left him for a woman. He also told Ashley that he didn't like the idea of Gracie growing up under the influence of their lifestyle. Brittany was sure that investigators needed to speak to Chad in regard to Ashley's disappearance. She provided investigators with Chad's details and police were able to find him in their database. It so happened that Chad was charged with assault against Ashley seven years prior. At 3.30 on Thursday, June 21, 2012, investigators knocked on the door of the home of Chad Cobb. There was no answer and investigators were still waiting to get the search warrant. They ran a background check on Chad once again and found a black Lincoln Navigator registered in his name. However, the address was different and was about half a mile away from the delivery location. Investigators decided to visit the new address and discovered that the property belonged to Chad's grandparents. As they descended on the house, their beams fell upon a black vehicle parked behind the property near a barn. Beyond the barn was a wooded area. When officers looked into the vehicle, they found a woman with four children. It was Chad's new wife, Erica Cobb. Investigators questioned Erica and took her into custody while family members were called to come and get the children. While searching the scene, officers heard noises coming from a nearby wooded area behind a chicken coop. A search team went out into the dark and soon found Chad hiding in the woods in camouflage gear. As he was escorted out towards the waiting police cars, the lights highlighted several patches of blood on his clothes. He was also taken into custody. When officers asked Chad about what he was doing hiding in the woods and what had happened to Ashley, he was uncooperative. Erica also refused to answer any questions and asked for a lawyer. The children were handed over to the care of Chad's grandparents while both husband and wife were taken to the police station. Both refused to speak. Investigators, though, were not sitting idly. A search warrant was being prepared by one team as another returned to the scene of Ashley's disappearance at daybreak. Apart from the pool of blood, Investigators also found drag marks in the blood and white paper dots that they knew came from a taser. Their suspicion of an ambush was growing stronger. Meanwhile, a second investigation team executed a search warrant on the properties of both Chad Cobb and his grandparents. In the woods behind the chicken coop, investigators found a backpack with a large knife inside, a neoprene mask, gloves, a taser, duct tape, and industrial-sized zip ties were found scattered on the ground where Chad was discovered. On these items, they found trace amounts of blood. It looked like an assault kit, and investigators were on the verge of getting their big break. Following this discovery, investigators used helicopters and dive teams to search for any trace of Ashley or her vehicle. It seemed like they'd hit a dead end when a call came in from a woman in neighboring Wayne County. The anonymous caller said her house, which was located on a hill, overlooked a cornfield. According to the caller, when she woke up, she noticed something shiny on the edge of the field. She called police believing someone may have been up to no good in the cornfield. When investigators arrived, they found a gray-colored Ford Taurus. It was similar to the vehicle owned by Ashley Biggs. As investigators looked inside, they found the body of a woman lying on the floor of the back seat. It was a bloody scene. The victim had been bound at the wrists and legs with industrial zip ties. She also had a zip tie around her neck. Her face had turned purple from lack of oxygen, and investigators saw several taser wires sticking out from her body. She also appeared to have been severely beaten. The victim was still wearing her pizza delivery uniform. Inside was an insulated pizza delivery bag and the untouched pizza from her last order. 
Investigators also found delivery stickers from several of the delivery orders made that night, including the order made at 11.42 p.m., stuck on the steering wheel. The body was removed and taken to the office of the Summit County Medical Examiner. In order to properly identify the body, investigators called Ashley's mother, Kimberly. She was asked if Ashley had any tattoos on her body, to which Kimberly responded that Ashley had two stars on the back of each arm and a belly button tattoo. They were able to confirm that the body they discovered was indeed that of Ashley. Chad was placed under arrest on suspicion of murder and refused to cooperate with investigators. He was detained at the Summit County Jail. Erica was allowed to go home. Investigators had no evidence that linked her to Ashley's murder. On June 22, 2012, Dr. Lisa Kohler, the chief medical examiner for Summit County, performed Ashley's autopsy. She determined that Ashley's cause of death was due to asphyxiation caused by the zip tie around her neck. Ashley showed signs of blunt force trauma to her scalp, face, and body. She also had defensive wounds on her wrists and back of her hand. Ashley's blood samples were taken and tested against the traces found on Chad's clothes and tools. They were a positive match. After Chad was arrested, Ashley's family and friends spoke to investigators about the years of abuse she endured. Ashley's partner Brittany also revealed that Chad had started harassing, stalking, and threatening violence against the two women after Ashley was awarded full custody of Grace. On Friday, June 24, 2012, Chad Cobb was formally charged and arrested for murder. His bail was set at $1.5 million. A written man, man accused of killing his child's mother appeared in court today. Chad Cobb was arraigned on aggravated murder and kidnapping charges. In June, police found the body of Ashley Biggs bound and gagged inside a vehicle in New Franklin. Cobb and Biggs shared custody of their six-year-old daughter. Court records show their battle over how often Cobb got to see the child was heating up. Cobb will be back in court later this month. During his arraignment, Chad was informed that he'd be facing the death penalty. Chad agreed to a plea deal with over nine charges that included aggravated murder, aggravated robbery, and kidnapping. On Tuesday, February 26, 2013, Chad pleaded guilty to all the charges against him at the Summit County Common Pleas Court. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. It had seemed as if the case had been solved and the killer was now behind bars. However, investigators knew that it was a woman who made the phone call. They knew Chad would have needed a second person to drive his car to the cornfield in Wayne County. This suspicion kept New Franklin detective Michael Hitchings interested in the case well after Chad's sentencing. Investigation I didn't feel was complete because we didn't get the other person. Coldheartedly, we believed that there was a female involved. We were thinking definitely that somebody else helped him by making the phone call and most likely obviously driving him there because he couldn't have drove both cars out. Suspicion fell on Erica, but there was never any solid evidence that implicated her. When I came in contact with her at the house, first thing Erica said was she didn't want to talk to us. I don't an attorney. Most people, I would say, would be concerned a little for somebody who's missing. She had no emotions, didn't want to talk about it. So that kind of steered me to believe she was involved from the get-go. During the initial investigation, officers made a rather interesting discovery. They'd found a receipt from a local Walmart for the purchase of a prepaid phone on June 20th, 2012. Surveillance footage showed an image of Chad, Erica, and their children exiting the store. This, however, was not proof that she was in any way involved in the murder. Erica had moved on with her life following the arrest. She filed for divorce from Chad while he was awaiting sentencing and began dating Chad's childhood friend, Mike Stefanko. Erica and Mike eventually got married and had a baby together soon after Chad was sentenced. But betrayal is a bitter pill to swallow and Chad was not a fan of the changes happening around him. When Chad was sentenced, Erica often brought the children to visit him in prison. As the years passed and she became more involved in her new marriage and life, those visits started to dwindle until they became non-existent. Around this time, Gracie, Chad and Ashley's daughter, had started writing him letters in prison. In these letters, she told Chad about the emotional, physical, and mental abuse she faced at the hands of Erica. She often wrote about how unhappy she was living with her stepmother and their new family. Chad was growing increasingly frustrated, and after four years of being in prison, finally, and certainly unexpectedly, he decided it was time to come clean about Ashley's murder. He wrote a letter to Detective Michael Hitchings. 
In the letter, he confessed to the detective that it was Erica who made the call for the pizza and used the alias Jen. He also told Hitchings that Erica was the mastermind of the murder and drove him to the location of the murder in his Lincoln Navigator. Chad added that they needed to speak to his mother, Cindy Cobb, who had evidence that could help their case. This was the break Hitchings and his team of investigators were waiting for. They contacted Cindy, who agreed to meet with them in January 2018, almost six years after the murder. Cindy provided investigators with a recording of a conversation she had with Erica two years after Ashley's murder in March 2014. On the recording, Erica openly discusses the murder with Cindy and confessed that she was not forced in any way by Chad to help lure Ashley out for the fake pizza order. When investigators asked Cindy what made her record the conversation, she told them that it was insurance for her son Chad. It seemed to investigators that Erica had not only made an enemy of Chad, but also of Cindy. Since Erica remarried, she'd started to keep her and Chad's children away from their grandmother, which created a strain. From what investigators had learned about the case, they surmised that the following events led up to the murder of Ashley Biggs. After Chad lost custody of Gracie, he started to grow resentful of Ashley and her newfound lifestyle. He and Erica conspired to lure Ashley out and silence her in order to make their problems go away. Erica made the call to Domino's that fateful night, knowing Ashley was the delivery driver on duty. Erica provided an address in a quiet part of the city that didn't see much traffic at that hour. She then drove herself, the kids, and Chad out to the area to wait for Ashley. The instructions were for Ashley to park in the front of the building and meet the person who ordered the pizza at the back. Unaware, Ashley made her way to the back of the building and was surprised by Chad and Erica. Chad proceeded to taser Ashley and render her unable to defend herself. He then proceeded to zip tie her arms and legs before beating her unconscious. After his brutal attack on Ashley, he then strangled her with a zip tie. Chad then dragged Ashley back into her own car and had Erica and the kids follow him to the cornfield in Wayne County. Once Chad dumped the car along with Ashley's body in the field, Erica drove him back to his grandparents' house. Chad may have expected to get rid of the evidence in the wooded area. However, he didn't expect the police to catch up with him so quickly and was in the middle of scattering the evidence when he was discovered in the woods. Now, armed with a confession, investigators started to develop a case against Erica. However, it would prove to be difficult because the man accusing her was her scorned ex-husband who already took the blame for the murder. But in her very own words to Cindy, Erica admitted to being part of the murder and even assisting. On November 11, 2019, Erica was arrested and charged with aggravated murder, murder, aggravated robbery, and kidnapping. The prosecution faced an uphill battle as they worked to develop a strong case against her. They focused on the law of complicity. They believed that without Erica's help, Chad would not have been able to go ahead with the murder. This ensured that both Erica and Chad would be found guilty of murdering Ashley no matter what part either of them played. The prosecution also depended on character witness testimony from individuals who knew about the feud between Ashley, Chad, and Erica. A year after her arrest, Erica Stefanko went on trial for her part in the murder of Ashley Biggs. 
The prosecution's opening statements argued that Erica was a key player in Ashley's murder and that without her, it wouldn't have happened. The state would ask, as you listen to the evidence and testimony, that you keep in mind that a person who knowingly aids, helps, assists, encourages, directs or associates herself with another either for the purpose of committing or in the commission of a crime is regarded as if she were the principal offender and is just as guilty as if she personally performed every act constituting the offense. The state would like that you keep in mind as you listen to the testimony and evidence that when two or more persons having a common purpose to commit a crime and one does one part and the second does another, those acting together are equally guilty of that crime. However, the defense focused on Chad Cobb. They argued that Chad was using this as a way to reduce his own sentence and secure himself an early release date. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a person who, after eight years now, after never mentioning it before, until really about 2017, he's stewing in that prison and now he's trying to get out from under full responsibility because he wants to drag somebody else down to his level. He wants to get out of prison early. He wants his sentence shortened. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the kind of person that you are going to try to evaluate. Someone that took the mother of his daughter, ambushed her, beat her, and strangled her. And you are going to determine how much truth is in his statement. Chad Cobb testified remotely about Erica's role in Ashley's murder. This was also the first time he'd said it was Erica who strangled Ashley. Was Ashley already dead? Yes, sir. Did you strangle her? I'm not the one who strangled her, sir. Would you please repeat that? I am not the one that strangled her, sir. I see. So now you pled guilty, and now you're saying that you didn't kill her. Is that right? Yes, sir. Chad and Ashley's daughter, Gracie, was called to testify about her relationship with Erica and the torment she faced at her hands. I remember going to a dance where we had like the matching dress and I remember, I remember having good times, but then I also remember having bad ones. And the bad ones, do you know how frequently or often they were? I don't remember how like often, but I just remember them happening. All right. And what types of things are we talking about that you're remembering? She was mentally abusive and physically. And how was she mentally abusive? She would tell me that if I told my dad what she was doing to me, then she would do worse. And I kind of figure that's like mentally. And you said physically, so what was the physical type of abuse? Um, she would, I remember she would hold me on the ground and she would hit me. And then she also before made me eat dog feces. So let's talk about that. Do you know why she made you eat dog feces? Because she was jealous of my relationship with my father. With, your, with who? With my father. With your father. Gracie also told the court that she remembered Erica making the phone call to order pizza, but couldn't remember the exact details. A friend who wanted to remain anonymous and testified off-camera painted a damning picture of Erica's hatred towards Ashley. 
um, during the dinner conversation wasn't so much about Ashley in that conversation. Um, but she had talked about her before. Pretty, she, she really kind of expressed her hate for her. Um, she had talked about, um, and I don't know how, how anybody could do this, but um, she talked about how she had gotten into her email and social media accounts and she could see what was what Ashley was doing, what she was saying, what she knew, um, things like that. Did she talk about after Ashley was murdered anything she may have done um, in regards to Ashley? Um, she did say that after. Um, after everything had happened, that she would visit Ashley's grave. And at one point, I know that she had um, she had said that she had defecated on her grave. Having heard the witness testimonies and closing arguments from both sides, the jury deliberated for three days before returning to court on November 25th, 2020. They found Erica guilty of aggravated murder and murder but not on the charges of aggravated robbery and kidnapping. In July 2021, Erica was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole in 30 years. After sentencing, she spoke to Ashley's family and Gracie, telling them that she'd gladly take whatever blame they wanted to place on her if it gave them peace of mind. Your Honor, if it is healing and helpful to Ashley's family, and friends. If it is helpful for Cindy Cobb to exonerate her child for his own actions by putting the blame on me, if that helps these people, particularly people who are victims, I can accept that. I was most certainly my worst self during my relationship with Chad. I have never been a hateful person. I would never have wanted what happened to Ashley Biggs, regardless of what statements people think that they heard on that tape. And all I can do at this point for her family and friends is to Pray for God's peace and comfort for them. In July 2022, Erica's conviction was overturned after the Ninth District Court of Appeals found that her rights were violated by the remote testimony of Chad Cobb. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, Chad was forced to testify from a separate courtroom. The appeals court found that it violated Erica's right to a fair trial due process of law, and to confront the witness under the 5th, 6th, and 14th Amendments of the Constitution. A date for Erica's retrial is yet to be set. In December 2022, Erica requested that her bond be lowered as she awaits a retrial. Prosecutors argued that Erica posed more of a flight risk after she'd been convicted of aggravated murder. Summit County Common Pleas Judge Joy Malik Oldfield upheld Erica's original bond, which was set at $2 million. She remains at the Summit County Jail, awaiting her retrial. Ashley's murder has had a ripple effect on all the people involved in or affected by the crime. Gracie's left without her mother, and now her father, who will never see freedom again. She remains in the custody of her grandmother, Cindy Cobb. Cindy, however, has not seen her other two grandchildren since Erica's sentencing, as her family was awarded guardianship. For Ashley's family and friends, the pain is even worse. They have no relationship with Gracie and have to live with the daily reminder that Chad tore their lives apart with one single selfish act. For Chad and Erica's children, they're constantly burdened by the knowledge of their parents' cruelty that had destroyed so many lives of the people around them. In the end, they too have been left without the guidance of either parent, just like their half-sister Gracie. Chad and Erica's actions destroyed not only their own lives, but that of so many around them. Their actions left their children without parents. And even though Erica may not have been the one to kill Ashley, 
she was equally responsible and instrumental in her death. So taking all this into account, who do you think were the real victims of this senseless crime? Do you believe Erica deserves to serve a life sentence for her actions? Let us know in the comment section below. And if you found today's video interesting, please consider subscribing to our channel, hitting that like button, and sharing our video with other crime enthusiasts. Also, if you have any true crime story that you'd like us to cover, please leave us a message in the comment section below.